Hello, East Coast, West Coast, and to our international audience around the world. My name is Adrian Dan, and on behalf of the ASMBS, the Bariatric Surgical Training Committee, and my co-moderators, I would like to welcome you to this edition of the Fellows Project Series Lecture Series. Joining me today um, is a future Hall of Famer, Dr. Knorr Jane Spangler, and the West Coast session will be hosted by Dr. Julianne Lloyd and Dr. Judy Chen. Every first Friday of the month, we bring the world of bariatric surgical education together for high quality didactics by content experts and over the course of the academic year, we cover the major topics within the updated ASMBS educational curriculum. Our interactive lectures meet the cognitive criteria for the ASMBS certificate of additional training, so make sure you remember that for your application at the end of the fellowship year. As a reminder, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom app and enter your name, institution, and any questions you might have. We will get to as many of the questions um, as it is possible, and there will be a separate Q&A session for the East and West Coast broadcasts of the, of the lectures. So today we have two wonderful speakers and uh, the quality of the lectures is, um, is gonna be fantastic because I, I know both of these guys on a personal level and it's nice to be able to introduce a couple, a couple of friends. Dr. Matt Crow is the section head of surgical endoscopy at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. He has recently returned from Abu Dhabi where he was a leader in the Digestive Disease Institute of the Cleveland Clinic at that institution. He is also the Vice Chair of Innovation and Technology at the Cleveland Clinic and Professor of Surgery for the Lerner College of Medicine. Um, Matt and I have had an ongoing friendship for over 16 years now, and I always use our, um, our relationship, um, working relationship, uh, as an example of how a fellow and a resident can work together on the same service beautifully in both uh, really benefit from the educational experience. I had a great time working with Matt when I was a fellow and he was a resident there. Our second speaker, also a good friend, is Dr. Osnan Morales. I was joking with him a little bit earlier that he does not seem to age. Um, Dr. Morales is Assistant Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School and also Director of Surgical Artificial Intelligence and the Innovation Laboratory at Mass General. Um, I'll embarrass him a little bit with a story. I remember being a chief resident when Oz was, uh, I believe, a second year resident. We were up all night with traumas, never went to sleep, rounded, and finally sat down to have some breakfast. He was preoccupied on how he could make his rudimentary cell phone at the time, this is 2003 or four, um, act as a remote control for a rudimentary TV. This is before smartphones or or um, or flat screen TVs, but somehow he made it work. And I've always known that he, that was gonna be his area of interest and he would become a leader in artificial intelligence just based on that experience alone. So Oz, maybe later on, you can tell me exactly how you made that, that 2002 Nokia act as a remote control, because I still don't get it. But before that, we'll have Dr. Crow start with a lecture on some of the emergent procedures. And, you know, if there's one thing about the 70 year old history of bariatric surgery, if things have continued to evolve and change where new procedures um, improve on the shortcomings um, and the benefits of the, the previous procedures. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the, the, the floor here to Dr. Matt Crow. Thanks Adrian for the kind introduction. Hello everyone, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I have the uh, charge of presenting a, a fantastic topic, uh, which is quite broad and expansive and will be uh, fast paced and somewhat compressed, but hopefully we'll generate some conversation in the Q&A at the end. So again, a pleasure to be here um, and uh, to contribute to this project. These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to this talk. So I think it's, it's important to put into context innovation and in our specialty, and that includes definition of obesity uh, and the evolution of, of metabolic surgery. But you have to realize that the type of interventions that we apply um, is based on a, a, a spectrum of different factors. And this is particularly important to me having just come back 
from the United Arab Emirates, where I was for five years, to, to Cleveland, Ohio. And the practice patterns vary differently. And I'm sure these can be applied to your practice as well. And these include local regional disease, patient behaviors, surgeon skill and training, and access to and delivery of care, all important considerations when looking at the types of procedures and interventions we have. And we know that there's a worldwide pandemic that hundreds of thousands of operations are performed around the world. And at least 50 different surgical procedures have been proposed. And many of these are variants of more common operations that will largely be what I talk about today. What's interesting in this mix of operations is over how a relatively short period of time, just 10 short years, the distribution of types of operation worldwide varies tremendously. And why is that? Well, one, there's a worldwide pandemic and there's an incredible need for these interventions, but our specialty is among the most progressive. Uh, in the beginning of bariatric surgery, we were aided by a rapid adoption of laparoscopy. And overall, this is a newer field with rapid turnover in terms of operations and therapies delivered. New devices and technologies require careful vetting and analysis. And I do wanna to touch on this because this has important implications for patients for providers such as ourselves and for healthcare systems. And the pathway in which devices and surgeries become approved or standardized is not, is not um, equal across the board. And there are different entities that regulate and promote this. There are professional societies like ASMBS, and there are tools within these societies like MBSA QIP, which can grant accreditation and give feedback on outcomes. There are obviously government entities, national organizations, including the Department of Health and FDA, and then payers, and that includes both public and private, all of whom are stakeholders in this pathway. And all of these potentially have different values and goals, and to get a procedure to a patient uh, is highly variable. Within ASMBS, there are approved procedures. This is the pathway by which procedures undergo approval. Um, I put a link down here at the bottom. I won't get into this today just for uh, the short period of time we have. But I think it's important if you're interested in new technology, how our society actually vets and approves uh, procedures. And it puts these procedures into different categories, whether they are approved, um, which is the majority of procedures that you're performing in your fellowship now. There are investigational procedures, which means that uh, the, the ultimate verdict is still out requires uh, third-party oversight, and we look at accrual of data and data reporting in our national databases. And on a local level, uh, this requires institutional review board. Um, and really, at the end of the day, the goal of this is to ensure that rights and welfare of our patients is protected, <clears throat> even in the face of, of innovation. So having said that, what's new? Well, in our specialty, um, pot is new. Sleeve gastrectomy is the most common operation performed worldwide and probably the most common performed in many of your fellowships. And there's a reason why. It's technically easier, though it's not an easy operation. I, I will say that caveat, it's, it is faster and it's potentially safer. Long-term data uh, is accruing, uh, but maybe doesn't have the track record of gastric bypass. But if you look at sleeve gastrectomy, and variations of sleeve gastrectomy, there are many different ways in which there have been um, inventions uh, or deviations or improvements on this operation. These are just a few of them. And I want to talk about a few of these operations that have penetration both in the United States and also abroad. And I think it's important as bariatric surgeons to realize what's happening, not just in the U.S., uh, but around the world. So banded sleeve gastrectomy has um, uh, some enthusiasm and data published on this. Uh, a lot of this has come from Europe and uh, Southeast Asia. This is placing a band over a sleeve gastrectomy, typically at the time of the, the primary operation, but sometimes also is a revisional procedure. It involves a perigastric technique and the band is typically placed about four to five centimeters from the GE junction and sutured in place. Um, this study from Bandari et al, who has published a, a large um, body of data on this has shown that there may be some better weight loss at five years with overall few complications. But of course, as we know, there are concerns about foreign body placement around anywhere in the GI tract, uh, maybe especially at the time of primary operation and erosion and proximal dilation have been reported. 
sleep gastrectomy plus. These are a series of operations that look at uh, sleep gastrectomy with another metabolic component. And probably one of the best studied and most widely reported is uh, the sleep gastrectomy of duodenal jejunal bypass. This can be done with either a loop or root configuration. Um, the loop in particular is technically simpler than root wide gastric bypass and may potentially have lower complications. I think the main driving factor for this is that obviously it's a sleep gastrectomy, but there is an additional metabolic component to this. And potentially in some literature has shown that there may be less weight regain long-term and better initial weight loss. It has also been proposed that there may be less dumping with this operation. The main reason why this operation uh, is popular is in areas of the world where gastric cancer is endemic, um, this allows for better opportunity for surveillance of gastric mucosa, but also adding a metabolic component. Uh, and the outcomes therefore are based on metabolic outcomes. And uh, the, the literature demonstrates efficacy and safety in short term, but longer term data really needs to be uh, generated for this to be uh, fully evaluated. A newer and interesting uh, addition in the, the sleeve gastrectomy variations is uh, the vertical clip. This is a, a laparoscopically placed vertical clip that mimics not just a sleeve gastrectomy, um, but uh, an older operation. Um, and the potential advantages of this are obvious that there's no gastric division. This may be more or less reversible, though there's likely going to be scarring after this operation and it mimics sleeve gastrectomy anatomy. There've been a few series looking at um, short-term outcomes and relatively large groups of patients. And at least in the up to two year mark, it looks like uh, weight loss metrics seem to be pretty good with this vertically placed bariatric clip. But probably the most impactful newer operation in the US and potentially around the world, certainly in Europe as well, is the single anastomosis duodenal ileostomy. It was introduced in 2007 as a modification of a, du of a standard duodenal switch by Sanchez Pernat uh, and published in 2010. It's known by several different ac acronyms, SADES, SIPS, uh, and so forth. But the basic idea of these operations is the same. Why SADI? It appears that maybe at least in the short term and probably longer term as data accrues that there may be better weight loss and certainly less weight regain. And it may be an, a, a better procedure as a conversional procedure for weight regain after sleeve gastrectomy and maybe um, mitigate some of the fewer long-term complications of rural gastric bypass such as marginal ulceration, internal hernia, especially in the loop configuration. And compared to standard duodenal switch, rude duodenal switch may, has, may have fewer complications. Uh, which would include micro and macronutrient deficiencies. Technical components of this uh, start with performance of a sleeve gastrectomy. This is typically wider than a standard primary standalone sleeve gastrectomy. Dissection has been carried down to the antrum and the pylorus and the post pyloric uh, region, usually to where the GDA uh, is visible. The duodenum is then encircled uh, and divided distal to the pylorus because that's going to be an important cuff uh, for our anastomosis. Typically that's about two to four centimeters. Sometimes division of the right gastric artery allows for mobilization. And then a retrograde measurement uh, is made. And this is really important to make sure that this is accurate and typically freehand sutured, either laparoscopic or robotically uh, to perform a duodenal ileostomy with a loop configuration and afferent and efferent limbs. The advantages of this is that the pylorus is preserved um, uh, when compared to rural gastric bypass, and there may be implications in terms of um, uh, delivery of uh, especially high uh, volume sugars with high osmotic gradient to um, the duodenum, uh, and uh, the pylorus may mitigate some of these effects, uh, which could be consistent with dumping syndrome. Uh, obviously, there's only one anastomosis. Uh, compared to duodenal switch standard, and this reduced operative time compared to standard duodenal switch and length of stay. And it may allow for performance in a more broad uh, spectrum of patients and settings. And at least in terms of outcomes, uh, with the series of publications now, in terms of uh, excess weight loss, these are compelling numbers and seem to be overall higher than rheumatoid gastric bypass and certainly than sleeve gastrectomy. And the data is accruing uh, on this and a systematic review of 14 studies has shown that uh, 
total body weight loss at up to two years is between 25 and 45 percent. Um, and increasingly, longer term data is also being shown. And this is studies that exist with more than five year follow up showing that, that total body weight loss is sustained with good follow up in these patients. However, root like gastric bypass is one of the oldest operations that we do uh, and uh, is still shown to be effective and durable for treating obesity and weight related diseases. However, these are being performed in decreasing numbers. And I'm sure many of you see this in your fellowships as other operations become more popular, but it's still widely regarded as a standard by which others are evaluated. We have more rigorous scientific data with frequent studies, more than 10 year follow-up. However, there are challenges. Uh, this is a technically uh, complex uh, operation uh, to teach and to perform, but it has shown long-term durability. And what are the variations of ruin like gastric bypass? Well, probably the most important variation is the one anastomosis gastric bypass, which hasn't had much uh, visibility in the United States, but is becoming increasingly popular worldwide. It's actually in its initial description, in an older operation, more than 20 years old, and it basically involves creating a longer gastric pouch to decrease potentially bile reflux. It's a single anastomosis, uh, so it's technically easier to perform, and it's largely based on malabsorption um, as well as bypass of the duodenum. It's particularly popular in areas of the world, including the Middle East, um, Southeast Asia in particular, but all of Asia and parts of Europe. Uh, however, there is longer term data accruing, much like Saudi, but uh, a little bit behind in terms of its uh, full development. However, there's significant interest in this. This was a consensus statement put out by IFSO uh, with a broad spectrum of surgeons from around the world, uh, looking at technical considerations and post-operative cares. Obviously, there are challenges to the literature for this in terms of uh, uh, applicability to widespread use and some bias in terms of how this was constructed, but clearly an interest in something that you need to be aware of as a, as a trainee. At Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi, our group published, um, I think, an important study looking at conversion of what an anastomosis gastric bypass to rule and why. Um, now, of course, we don't know the denominator in terms of the total number of these operations done, and this is a small single series study, but uh, we need to be careful about what this looks like long term in terms of mainly bioreflux. Uh, dysphagia and malnutrition. And there have been proposals of uh, modification of this technique. Um, this was a, a, a single anastomosis gastroileal operation, looking at technical details and preliminary results, but really uh, looking at modifications of a standard one anastomosis gastric bypass um, uh, to, to make it less of a malabsorptive operation. So what's on the horizon and what are some future interventions and specifically non-surgical? I wanna switch gears a little bit and look at endoluminal applications. Obviously I think many of you are aware that endoscopy has very distinct advantages because it avoids surgical interventions and has low morbidity. Uh, the disadvantages are of course that training is highly variable and the tool set is somewhat limited and many of these procedures uh, lack the durability of our surgical procedures. But before I talk about endoscopic procedures, <clears throat> I wanna make a clear point that endoscopic procedures probably will not replace our surgical intervention and they're probably more effective than medical surgery. So there's a subgroup of patients that will benefit from this. And how will they benefit? They'll benefit from new platforms uh, that look more sophisticated than our standard endoscope now, that have uh, devices and instruments that are interchangeable, that allow for basic laparoscopic principles like triangulation, retraction, and tissue division. And these are future uh, models that are in clinical trials, but we have platforms and instrumentations that exist for other advanced endoscopic procedures like POEM and POP and, and ESD currently, like triangle tip knives, insulated tip knives, and hook knives that look like our laparoscopic instruments. We have better suturing devices and we have better uh, tissue annealment devices, uh, such as clipping, that allow us to do more complex endoluminal procedures. And who are these patients that are considering uh, endoscopic intervention? Well, sometimes these are, are, are patients that want or need treatment for obesity and weight-related disease, but they simply aren't candidates for bariatric surgery. Maybe they won't tolerate general anesthesia, but most commonly they're patients that don't want surgery. Um, and that's typically a, a patient preference, and that eliminates them from undergoing 
uh, interventions that otherwise would be very effective for them. Other patients may be very high risk, and these can be bridge procedures to definitive laparoscopic bariatric surgery. And others, as I'm sure you've seen, come to clinic not to treat obesity or weight-related diseases, but to be eligible for other operations. And particularly, we see this commonly with transplantation, but also with orthopedic surgery and hernia surgery, because we know that those operations uh, are more likely to fail with patients with severe obesity and weight-related disease. So I want a quick overview of, of uh, I want to go through a quick overview of, of some of the endoluminal devices and approaches that we have, um, and uh, not so much a, a, a data-driven discussion, but kind of where we are with these devices. Intragastric balloons are, are used mainly for class one and class two obesity. There is a wide variation worldwide in terms of delivery of this technique uh, and patient acceptance. And, uh, and depending on where your practice is in the United States or where your fellowship is, you may or may not get exposure to balloons, but there are certain parts of the world where this is um, uh, widely and commonly done. And the, the reason why is that these are um, temporary and reversible. Reversible may or may not be desirable. Uh, and increasingly, they may not even require endoscopy. Uh, for success, we know this has to be part of a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, the displacement of a balloon is unlikely to have long-term success. And we know that they probably uh, are effective due to a, a, a series of physiologic changes, including delays in gastric emptying and altered accommodation by fundic distension. And the types of balloons have, have different um, desirable uh, implantation techniques and uh, side effects and removal periods. There are 12 month duration uh, balloons, there are double balloon configurations, uh, there are multiple balloon configurations. And as I said, there are, are balloons that don't require endoscopy at all that are, are swallowable and can be deployed in an outpatient setting. If we look at the weight loss associated with intragastric balloons in US pivotal randomized control trials, the expectation is that this may result in six to 15% total body weight loss versus one to 5% in lifestyle alone. There are low severe adverse events but this is not zero, so this has to be discussed with patient. But we also know that weight regain is, is um, uh, after removal is, is common. So this is probably less than at the initial baseline. So in addition to balloons, what else do we have? We have improvements in suturing devices uh, with in, improved overall technologies. We have more robust uh, suturing mechanisms compared to what we used to have that involved curved needles and uh, tissue retraction. And these have been applied to both primary procedures and revisional procedures. And we know that uh, patients that have had bariatric surgery may need uh, re-intervention. This is obviously widely variable amongst the type of operations that are done. So what are the outcomes in terms of revisional procedures? The endoscopic suturing devices initially were applied for anastomotic reduction for patients who have had most commonly ruled by gastric bypass and have had weight regain and have had either dilated pouches or dilated gastrojejunostomy. These are typically technically successful uh, with low overall complication rates and some durability of excess weight loss at three, six and 12 months, seems to be about 10 to 11 kilograms. Uh, and this group from Boston showed that this is probably durable for a longer period of time in a revisional setting at least up to three years in a relatively small cohort of patients. Now this procedure is being applied to primary endoluminal sutured procedures, uh, most commonly endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This is an example of an endoluminal procedure that uses internal uh, suture application along the greater curvature, typically in two rows, to form a sutured internal gastroplasty uh, in a small tubularized stomach that at least radiographically would mimic a sleeve gastrectomy afterwards, but does not result in the same results. Uh, and physiologically, it's probably quite different as well. Data on this is nascent. This is one of the uh, bigger studies looking at 250 patients uh, from three centers at 24 month follow-up with a primary endpoint of greater than 10% total body weight loss. 84% of patients um, on a per protocol or method achieve this and 53% on an intention to treat analysis. And like many procedures, uh, this has been shown to be uh, better with adjunctive therapies, uh, including counseling and medical therapy. 
An interesting application of sutured gastroplasty is revision of either sleeve gastrectomy or ESG. This is a very small case series, but at least uh, demonstrates the concept of um, endoscopic suturing after dilation in a sleeve gastrectomy with a relatively small overall BMI change, but at least proof of concept. There have been interesting applications of this device also for non-weight loss mechanisms such as dumping. Uh, and this seems to be a pretty good application for uh, sutured gastrojejunal revision, dumping after the rule and gastric bypass. Other endoluminal um, techniques and uh, applications uh, have been barrier liners, either placed most commonly in the duodenum and at least experimentally in the esophagus. The advantage of this barrier liner is that it is an endoscopically placed device. It is uh, reversible and removable and it excludes some portion of uh, the proximal GI tract from absorption. However, at least um, uh, in terms of uh, studies, um, at least in terms of studies, it's shown that there is some uh, effect, especially from a metabolic standpoint. This is a multi-center randomized study uh, looking at placement uh, for three months, and it showed good metabolic uh, effects, at least in terms of diabetes. Uh, but with four explants for migration, pain, and obstruction. And in uh, uh, their US-based study, this device uh, was stopped because there was a higher than expected severe adverse event rate, specifically liver abscesses, probably from uh, uh, translocation of bacteria uh, during placement of the barb in the duodenum. And this has halted further investigation of this device, at least in the United States. Other endoluminal techniques that I think we should at least touch base on and you should be aware, gastric aspiration and the commercially available device is the Aspire Assist. This is a gastrostomy based device uh, in a multicenter trial looking at a large number of patients showed uh, good effectiveness at one year with a percent total body weight loss of 12%, though a, a fairly large standard deviation and, and met a, 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 its primary endpoint and an overall uh, good safety profile um, but this obviously is a bit cumbersome uh, and may not be so desirable for patients uh, who have to um, attach themselves to this device, uh, evacuate um, the, the food as they eat it, and potential long-term implications, um, uh, fistula, uh, drainage, uh, skin excoriation, similar to uh, gastrostomy. Endoscopic magnetic partial diversion is a, a a magnetically, uh, uh, an endoscopically deployed magnetic device from both a transanal and transoral approach, allowing for two magnets to be deployed, uh, forming an anastomosis and a partial diversion. Eventually the magnets uh, cause tissue necrosis and effective sealing, and those are expelled uh, distally. Percent total weight loss of 12 minutes has been shown to be um, relatively consistent with other endoluminal procedures and pilot studies. Uh, nausea and pain are, are common uh, in a short course of diarrhea. One of the challenges of this is that data is lacking and, and widespread adoption outside the US has not necessarily occurred. An interesting, um, another application of uh, endoluminal treatments that, that seem to show promise is endoscopic duodenal mucosal resurfacing. Applications of this have not been for weight loss, but for treatment of uh, diabetes and fatty liver disease. This is a cold ablation of the duodenum uh, past the papilla. Relatively low complication rates uh, can be repeated and has shown some success uh, with reduction of hemoglobin A1C. And uh, now much of the research targets are looking at fatty liver disease. So where do we stand? Obviously uh, the Transition from open to laparoscopic surgery uh, has resulted in important improvements in terms of recovery, complications, length of stay, and patient acceptance. And endoscopy won't replace laparoscopy, but I think will be uh, complementary to laparoscopic procedures and uh, fill a niche uh, for patients that aren't uh, receiving treatment for obesity and weight-related diseases. And I want to put a plug in for the Be Safe program, which is a, a program supported by the ASMBS and SAGES, the Bariatric Endoscopy Skill Acquisition uh, Focused Examination. This is a web-based video curriculum, which can be accessed at both the ASMBS and SAGES website. 
once you've reviewed that video curriculum, you can register for, for a multiple choice online examination. And then there is a hands-on technical evaluation that will be held at uh, SAGES uh, in Denver and at future ASMBS meetings. And this results in a certification approved by both uh, societies. This is the web-based, um, uh, or the web address that you can look at. And I encourage all of you to check it out. I think it's a great curriculum. Uh, it can certainly help with your uh, endoscopic skills as well as certification. So in conclusion, um, obesity is a chronic disease that's gonna require multiple interventions over the lifespan of patients, including medical, surgical, and endoscopic interventions. Surgery has demonstrated long-term and durable success, um, but a relatively small number of patients have access to and undergo surgery. And new technologies may allow for, for different therapies both um, adjunctive uh, and primary over the course of uh, a lifespan of patients. So I know that was uh, a lot to take in in a relatively short period of time, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll peak a, a conversation at the end here. So thanks very much for your attention and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Matt. Certainly a, a wonderful review of these incredible innovations in our specialty. And it's exciting to see where the future of bariatric surgery is going. Uh, certainly, I think uh, we are um, lucky to be a part of the uh, specialty, which, which to me seems to be one of the most dynamic and exciting fields in the, in the world of modern medicine. But when it comes to the modernization of medicine, um, I think all of us can agree that uh, we're a bit behind regarding the use of artificial intelligence. And we're going to transition over to Dr. Oz Morales, who's going to tell us about, about potential applications for artificial intelligence in our field. Dr. Morales. Thank you, Adrian. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you, you and ASMBS for the invitation. Let me share my screen. So those are my disclosures. So let's go first with some uh, fine concepts. I bet a lot of people know about this already, but artificial intelligence is actually uh, a it's quite old, it's from the 1950s. And what it is, is the study of the algorithms that allow machines to have uh, cognitive functions and perform uh, you know, decision-making such as like humans. Machine learning is the algorithms that improve over time by utilizing the data based on its own experience. And there is different methodologies. And I think it's very important for us in surgery, the computer vision, that's how the machines, they understand images and videos. So, um, as an example, what we have in our societies, such as the, in a reality, like the IBM Watson supercomputer or the Tesla auto drive that's actually checking, uh, you know, bicycle pedestrians and, um, and cars. And what our aspirations goes for general or super AI come from the Marvel movies, such as or Blade Runner, Jarvis from uh, Iron Man. But what's actually happening in surgery? That's very important to understand. Uh, first, just giving a, a glimpse of the future of how much investment is going to be not just in surgery, but like in uh, AI and healthcare, by 2028, not far from, from today, in the, uh, the global market is going to be $120 billion of investments. And researchers also are making predictions when many different types of jobs will be uh, significantly uh, influenced by AI. And if you look at that uh, chart, you know, surgeons will be sometime between 20 to 80 years from now where we're going to be seeing the automation in what we do. Uh, that's another chart from the same uh, paper showing that also a uh, difference in, in, in geography where surgeons in Asia are probably going to start being replaced much sooner within 30 years than in Europe in 46. And why is this? Even though AI is, like I said, an old uh, field since the 1950s, what's happening right now, I have large amounts of data, video data, and much more powerful computing, and much more powerful and efficient techniques. So put all of that together, it brings where we are today. So just give an idea of some of the applications we already have uh, uh, with, uh, in our reality. This is like a very uh, a nice paper put out by, um, I believe it was Stanford, uh, dermatologist and nature, where they train the machine to see about more than 2000 different types of like skin diseases and they, they annotate those uh, slides and then they compare that by using convolutional neural networks. And across all the tasks, there was a par with expert dermatologists. Another application that we have now, this is just one example. This is from a company called AI, um, uh, Jeff for AI. 
and then they are from Canada. And here, what's happening is they're identifying polyps in a real time during an endoscopy. And not just identify, but also classifying them with the high likelihood of being uh, of the confidence. Like, the, for example, this one's quite hard for us to see until we get pretty close, but the machine is also helping us with the determination here. There are several companies coming on the market on Flex Endo for this. So next, I'll show some of what we're doing here in our lab, where this was, uh, is we're doing real-time identification of the surgical steps of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. What you can see that the red bar here is the ground truth, which are the, the surgeon's annotators, and the blue is the predictions that machines are making over time. And you can see that they're very, very close uh, to one another, including the dissection of the cystic duct, the cystic artery, the identification of the CVS, and moving forward. And not just us, but many other uh, labs and companies are already achieving that uh, accuracy. The other thing is very interesting to see is like, how about make surgical prediction about deviations, analysis what's happening and finding what's uh, happening next. So having an idea where I'm gonna play next is the, the mid column here is uh, our seven steps of a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, port placement, liver retraction, liver biopsy, the extraction of the gastrocolic ligament, uh, stapling, bagging inspection. And red means very high probability that something's occurring. Blue is very low probability or no probability something's occurring. Any color in between that is the prediction that's gonna be the next step. So let's play the first video here. So what happened here is the ports were placed, uh, the, the liver was retracted, the dissection of the gastrocolic ligament is occurring and the machine makes the prediction the next step is gonna be the stapling. And then as the stapling is ending, the next prediction is gonna be that it was gonna be placed in a bag and again, there was based on the, our uh, standard approach of Mass General. And it creates this color-coded uh, log probability bar that we call the surgical fingerprint. This other one is quite interesting. It's gonna pause for a second. This time what happened is we give a video that a machine has never seen before where the presence of adhesions uh, during a laparoscopic cystectomy. And then what the machine did is start the quite hectic predictions where, yes, I know the parts were placed, now I think the liver was retracted because we saw the liver and what's gonna happen next and go back. It was not until we lysed all those adhesions from a prior open uh, cholecystectomy to reconstruct the anatomy that the machine went back to the normal uh, pattern. And what it does, it creates a two surgical fingerprints. To the left is a normal case, a normal laparoscopic liver gastrectomy. And to the right side is the one that was abnormal, not because there was a complication, but because something was deviated from the standards. And this is current technology. So imagine with this already, what we can tell is that on this uh, paper that we published, that the very low log probability of the frame sequences uh, over time show that there were uh, comparable of like patients who had like lines of adhesions, bleeding, revisions, and others. And then if you can put it in, into practice, imagine that a normal case that will occur through the time will generate a normal surgical fingerprint. But then it could detect a complication or deviation of the standard. Even though that the machine is not capable with the current technology to tell which what exactly happened, just by knowing that something was out of ordinary, you can perhaps review the video, inspect better, keep the patient a little bit longer, uh, you know, to avoid the readmission. Potential current applications, think about notify attendings if the trainee is nearby a critical portion of the operation, such as if you let your residents uh, operate and then you see that it's getting close to the CVS and but before transecting the cystic uh, duct and artery, the attendee is notified to uh, assure that's correct. How about telementoring? If you're deviating from the norm, you could perhaps get a help from another expert surgeon to go there and help you better field, uh, support rural areas. And also peer review, imagine like how can we argument uh, more be mortality conferences with uh, this type of technology, or the chief of surgery can start using those uh, surgical fingerprints for credentialing and recredentialing. And what about automation? This is a very interesting paper uh, that was published by uh, UC Berkeley under Ken Goldberg, he's a roboticist. What they were able to use that information from computer vision to train, uh, let's see here, to train the Vinci robot to automate the tasks. So here, uh, the lesion is in red and the robot's doing the debridement. No human is operating the robot. 
the robot just being guided by computer vision to perform those tasks. Uh, and this, of course, is four times uh, faster than it's supposed to be. Similar here, like multi quadrants, the robot, very high accuracy, identifies the lesion in red and transect that. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Also, for uh, some uh, FLS tasks, uh, cutting a circular pattern, this is like a eight times faster. So the robot was half of the time uh, of humans and was accurate 70% of the times uh, in performing this task, which is quite impressive, right? With like this, this video, I believe is from uh, four years ago, but what we can do with the current technology. At the same time, we need to be skeptical because the 20%, the 30% of the time the robot was not able to do the failure modes, they were could be quite severe that was a human, right? For example, right now, the robot just went down in a retroperitoneal, for example, quite misses several times, misses the target. So the technology is not quite there. So it's very important to understand then when you talk about search AI, the hype versus what's, what's, what's reality. So we need to be cognizant about the obstacles we have, the limitations and the hype. And if you can actually you know, we need to be pragmatic about this and that by creating search AI at its own field, we have to understand that the limitations we have with data is the access to data, limited annotation, all the regulations that uh, hold us back in deploying those new technologies and a lot of bias that we have. Clinicians have very limited time, the pressure to produce, not to do research. There's a cultural thing that we need to go over about uh, recording videos. Researchers have very limited exposure to search core AI. They pretty much are just basing all those cranking numbers from ICU machines and so on and so forth. Industry market pressure to produce those like minimal viable products versus something that's going to be meaningful. And also the patients, you know, privacy, HIPAA, GDPR, among others. So if you want to start from the center, the data, the search code data, how is that being generated? Is the interaction between the clinicians, the patients, the researchers, the industry, and all of this is governed by several different levels, government, societies, and the ethics committees. So if we ought to develop search query out of the field, we should start, go from the basic for our data collection. As we collect a, a tissue specimen, goes to a container to the pathology report, we should do the same in video, go to USB drive or to the cloud, and then to the AI lab. And when you go back to the development of search query AI, if we're gonna divide in three uh, different uh, pillars, one is the foundation work, on annotation, data structure, and governance. Find out what our structural needs, what's gonna be a universal data acquisition framework and how we're gonna be managing uh, the data through its life cycle. And of course, through cultural uh, uh, knowledge uh, creation and dissemination, through education, uh, publication, and so on and so forth. So among the foundation work, uh, one of them is data. And the data is, is divided into you know, its own structure, uh, which is based on its organization and management of that, access of the data, the deployment of the data. Then as important, who are the users of the data? And you can see on the list on the left, goes from the patients, uh, hospitals to the patients, to the media, insurance companies. And the governance, right? Which, which governs the, the data can go from uh, local things such as IRDs and ethic committees through HIPAA, which is more national, state-wise in California or Transcon Nano in Europe with the GPR. So it's quite complex. The other thing that's very important too, ethics, have to see how those uh, eight uh, principles touch the data and how we're using the data for our patients, for ourselves and for research. Next, the annotation of the data and other foundational work. Annotation can be either be temporal or spatial. For example, here is a Tesla autopilot, which are annotating the figures on the right side just by labeling cars, pedestrians, stop signs and also performing actions and tasks, such as turning, accelerating, uh, stopping. Not much different than how we annotate surgical videos. To the left, the actions and tasks of cutting, uh, for example, cutting the cystic duct, retracting the gallbladder, now cutting the cystic artery. And to the right side, labeling the spatial features, the ducts, the artery, the instruments, and the gallbladder. Based on this, uh, this year was just published a work that was eight, 18 months uh, uh, in a work from uh, under the Hospice of Sages, which was a consensus recommendation for annotation framework for surgical video, where we created guidelines for spatial annotation, temporal annotation, and software requirements. With that, I'm gonna give you an example. Within the annotation of the spatial events, we created general anatomies, 
with general regions, specific anatomies, and tissue characteristics, which can be expanded to any different types of uh, annotations. And by this, we created this very uh, granular, expandable, hierarchical uh, annotation pattern, where if I do annotations from one procedure, I could then compare with different ones from different places. Similarly, we did for the temporal events, where phases are the highest temporal level, well, for example, the access to the abdominal cavity, the execution of the objects, and then the closure. Then the steps are a bunch more specific, and then they have a clinical meaningful goal, what are we going to be doing? For example, let's say a dissection of the gastropolic ligament, which you can perform that for several different procedures, sleeve, uh, a fundal plication, uh, among others. Then go to tasks more generic and actions, which are the most primitive components of the tasks. And if you do the same here on, for example, hierarchical uh, temporal uh, representation of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you can see that all those little building blocks could be exported to different procedures into different data sets to allow us to compare uh, more heterogeneous uh, data sets. Beyond that, we have to think about our scientific efforts through computer vision challenges. I'm going to explain that what is later. Collaboration among uh, several institutions and in, in, uh, partnership with academia and industry. We have to create standards for publication because it's not just saying that I use AI on a paper. That's, that was an AI paper. And of course, validation what we do and promote diversity because data can be biased. The education and training through scientific meetings or presentations such as this, this webinar, adopting this type of curriculum in medical schools, creating ded dedicated fellowships. For example, here in Boston, we have uh, every year a room for a MD and a PhD to do surgical AI research. And of course, publishing our results. Also, as important, the cultural transformation, we have to go through it. We have to learn that's okay to share our data, that's okay to share our knowledge and understand cultural differences. Let me give you this example. Ethical considerations on cultural differences. This is a very interesting paper published by uh, MIT Media Lab. Uh, it's called The Moral Machine. And the idea here is there is an autonomous car that's about to get into an accident. We're either going to kill the pedestrians or going to hit the barrier and going to kill the passengers, save the pedestrians. And what we found was as they surveyed people all over the world, there were different uh, geographic cultural uh, per perception about who should be you know, spared. And it was based on sparing females, pedestrians, uh, sparing the young, the higher status, the lawful. For example, in Japan, people are not uh, used to jaywalk. They always use the side, uh, you know, the crosswalks. If you're jaywalking, perhaps like they said, they, the car should hit them. So imagine how that would apply to surgery in different areas. Also other considerations are who actually owns the data? Is the patient, the provider, the hospital, the insurance company, perhaps all of them? Who do we give the credit if something goes right? But also, should we blame the machine or the physician who accepted the machine's the decision if something goes wrong? And how can we actually explain that to patients from now in the near future? And also, is the physicians ready to challenge the AI decisions? That being said, there is a long tunnel with a, a lot of lights guiding there, but not a light at the very end of the tunnel. But how can we get there is through collaborations, through things such as the annotation project that we did in Houston in 2020, uh, such as the summit that we just put together in the same framework, actually looking to the data structure, use governance and exploration. Through uh, ch research uh, efforts is the challenge. So the surgical challenge is when you try to identify images by using computer vision algorithms and who has the highest accuracy, it wins the challenge. So this is being put together by SAGES. It's called the Critical View of Safety Challenged. There was a website already. It's at www.cvschallenge.org. And what we are doing, we're getting 1,000 videos from all over the world uh, with a very heterogeneous and diverse data set. We're going to be annotating that uh, based on the standards that we put together. And we're going to be using the data structure to select the right type of frames so we can um, have a, a proper challenge out. Uh, this is a pretty much like a quarter million dollars project. And then uh, we're going to be launching this in the next Sages uh, uh, meeting. With all of that together, knowing the annotation, knowing the data structure, using the CVS as a case study, because we're going to be having to go a lot of the data sharing agreements to all of these institutions in the world. In 2022, it's going to have another summit on governance 
what many other uh, stakeholders are going to be included this time, malpractice insurance, patients as well, government officials, people from all over the world. So we can wrap all of this together and actually make uh, surgical AI a reality. Two other things important too, as among our structural needs, a data management framework that's universal, that can allow the standardization of the annotation, the data structure is transparent and has a clear ownership uh, and promotes collaborations. Furthermore, professional preparedness. I think in the, in the near future, we're gonna be needing perhaps some less physicians. The very first ones are probably gonna be getting, um, being not replaced, but uh, be less need of because you're gonna be relying on the AI, you'll be pathology, radiology. But you can imagine perhaps in hundred years from now, we're gonna be overseeing several Da Vinci robots or whatever robots in the future doing subtasks autonomous. So we're gonna to need to rely on credentialing and simulation as well. And then finally, for us to see search AI to be a reality, we need to wrap all of this together. You know, the data structure, the video acquisition framework, sharing our knowledge, the governance and the proper annotation. And if you see this happen, we can potentially foresee a future where all the knowledge is being shared in real time as we are operating, we can learn from other surgeons. Right now, when I'm operating and learning from myself and I have to sleep, next day go again, AI never sleeps. So if across the world, we're getting the knowledge of every single surgeon that's occurring at the same time, sharing their triumphs and their errors, we're learning together and creating this collective surgical consciousness. And if this is the reality, you can go beyond just detecting a complication and generating a error message at the end to perhaps preventing a complication to occur because we are based on this collective uh, knowledge and then generating a normal uh, report at the end of the case. That being said, I would like to thank all the team at SAO here in Boston. And uh, again, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to answering the questions. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you, Osnan. That was fantastic. What a, what a glimpse into the future. I wanna start with a question for you. So about two years ago, um, we conceived the idea of the Fellows Project as artificial intelligence specifically with regards to uh, video conferencing became more, more prominently used. And this was before the pandemic. It just so happened that we were able to utilize this. And we see this as an opportunity not to replace, but to substitute high quality lectures um, on a local level for all the fellows who might have a couple faculty and maybe the only fellow in their program. So we see this as a utilization of artificial intelligence and surgical education. So my question to you, and we both know the, the program that we came from had a, an emphasis on surgical education. Um, where else can we apply? How do you see the capabilities of AI to improve surgical education um, on a local, national, global level beyond video conferencing? Yeah, good question, Adrian. Thanks for, for that. So going back when showing about the surgical fingerprints, just as an, as an example, right? And we're talking about to prevent complications or, you know, like to avoid, you know, like uh, readmissions and so on and so forth. We can design metrics to see how residents are progressing through independent steps of each operation. Let's say, for example, we've applied this to the ASMBS uh, education training bariatric surgery. We, we can uh, deconstruct a bariatric procedure, let's say, sleep gastrectomy or gastric bypass in steps. And they probably gonna vary from place to place, but perhaps several similar, but within the same bucket of steps, right? Uh, and we can get this validated by expert consensus. And then we can start applying, you know, to machine learning computer vision. So then you get a set of surgical videos from your institution, you apply the annotation that was being proposed by let's say ASMBS, and then you see how the residents will progress over time to get and see how the surgical fingerprint will improve. And then you can compare residents with residents into the national level. The advantage of this would be, we're gonna be needing less human reviewers, which you know takes a lot of time to review a particular video. Thank you so much. One other question that we have in the chat here um, 
from Dr. Andrew Strong at Duke University. So how do you feel about uh, using data derived from the electronic med medical record itself to augment or supplement decision-making? So, you know, we're already doing this some with our risk calculators, et cetera, but do, do you see that taking on a whole other life of its own, predicting complications, suggesting surgical procedures being done, um, decisions like that? Very good question. Uh, there was another study of the, here at MGH. Uh, we're about to publish that. So we had this grant from Crico. Crico is the malpractice insurance from all the harder hospitals. And they actually funded that kind of AI uh, research look and outcomes. And what we did on that one was the, the, the risk prediction based on just on the image through the surgery, plus the risk prediction getting uh, some information from the medical records. And there was some augmentation on that. So it, it, it did improve. Although not significantly because the, the number of cases that we have, we need to uh, do a multi-collaborative, multi-institutional uh, research. But to be pragmatic, what I think we should do first, we should develop, it become very solid or happening droppably to, be, to then start comparing what happens like prior to surgery. Because if you start deviating, to start looking into outcomes, you're going to die this project kill this project because we're not going to be finding much of the, the deviation until we get like a thousands and thousands of videos. Thank you. Uh, one other question for Dr. Crow and Matt, this is a personal question. So I was actually listening throughout your lecture. I don't know if you realize this, but you covered uh, seven different topics on our didactics list. So thank you for that. Um, and, but as I was listening, I realized, you know, a lot of what we've done with a lot of these newer technologies, they're actually reiteration of things that we tried in the past, uh, barriers, et cetera. Uh, when you look at all of the things that you touched on today, if you had to do a, a, a Crow's top three, um, what are the things that you think are we were actually going to see effective, useful results from in the future when it comes to newer technologies? I think there's two major areas to look at for primary surgical interventions and then conversions. I think what We've realized in the last five to 10 years is that as effective as bariatric surgery is, obesity is a chronic disease, and much like medical therapy, uh, we'll need multiple interventions over time. I think this has largely propelled sleeve gastrectomy to its wide popularity. So I think that revisions, conversions will be a part of all of our practices um, for weight regain, less for complications as we get better. And I think that if you were to make a list taking those considerations in. I think that some sort of malabsorptive operation after sleeve gastrectomy will be very much a part of all of our practices in the next 10, 15 years. And I think some of the most compelling data for that comes from Saudi, uh, which has gained a lot of uh, traction uh, abroad and increasingly here in the States. So I think that all the fellows should be aware of that. And that's from a surgical side. And I think that the main application of that will be for revisional or conversional procedures. From an endoluminal side, you're right. Uh, you know, that was kind of a hodgepodge of a series of different devices that have had varying degrees of traction and interest. Probably the most commonly performed procedure worldwide, um, or at least the most uh, effective and gaining momentum procedure uh, is probably ESG. Obviously, there are challenges for this in terms of cost, which in some institutions, including ours, approximates a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. It's hard to justify that uh, in terms of outcomes, but there are certain patients that will seek that out. Um, I think the most important part of all of these procedures is staying tuned to what the data shows us. There's immense enthusiasm for certain procedures based on perceived ease of, of performing it, cost, uh, an application worldwide without naming any specific procedure, it's up to us to make sure that we vet the data, look at long-term outcomes and, and not be uh, too enticed by the cost or ease of performing it and the one, two, three year outcomes. What do these procedures look like at five and 10 years? Thank you. And yes, Matt, I think that was a record of the number of objectives. <laughs> That, that you you hit upon. I have a question for you, Matt, having come back from, uh, from the Middle East where the OAGB seems to have gained a lot of popularity, not just there, but across the, the rest of the world. What are they seeing that we're not seeing in this procedure that, you know, to some degree was quite vilified about 20 years ago here in the United States 
and why is it so popular there uh, and not here, specifically when some of the data regarding the metabolic impact appears to be quite convincing? Well, I think the most compelling part of the operation is that it's, it's technically easier to do. Um, there's not challenges of dissecting, dissecting uh, near the hiatus. Um, there's one less anastomosis. These are longer pouches, so reach is less of an issue. The loop comes up with, a, with less tension. And in populations um, where multidisciplinary programs don't exist, it seems to be very effective because it's incredibly powerful malabsorptive operation, especially depending on what that common channel looks like. So the outcomes are good. Patients are happy. They can eat uh, large volumes of food and their quality of life is good because they have a large pouch and they're losing weight. So in the short term, patients are very happy. My concern is, and, and we saw this in various parts of the US decades ago, what are the intermediate and long-term results of this procedure look like? Maybe especially in regions where follow-up is less, compliance with multivitamins, uh, yearly uh, blood testing uh, is maybe not as good. Um, and, and, and what are the implications of, of bile reflux uh, in these patients? So early data, around the world looks compelling um, and in some ways looks very similar to Saudi. Uh, however, I think Saudi with the preservation of the pylorus may eliminate some concerns about bioreflux. And any of these malabsorptive operations, it's critical that they be performed within a multidisciplinary team that has a focus on follow-up uh, beyond the initial operation, wherever they're performed. Th those are my caveats to any of those malabsorptive operations. I think we have one last question to round us out. Um, we are knowingly going over eight o'clock. We, we always do. Um, <laughs> it is archived for those of you who have to go, but we always have so many great questions. Um, I hate to, to cut any of them short. So to both of you, this is another one from the Q&A if you want to read it, but how has your practice changed over time to incorporate innovations in metabolic surgery? Um, this is a great point. How, how should programs balance training and innovation and training in the standard of care? Well, um, I have been a very strong proponent of endoscopy. I think it's an, I think Oz will agree with this. It's an incredible tool for a GI surgeon to manage complications, to uh, guide intraoperative decision-making uh, and preoperatively to evaluate revisional and primary patients. That tool can be used in other ways for endoluminal procedures too. Uh, and I think that at least in our fellowship, uh, you get exposure to all those aspects of endoscopy. With progressive surgical procedures, it's critically important that they go through the process of um, uh, experimental uh, in evolution with data reporting, uh, publishing, and contributions to a national database like MBSAQIP, uh, and then eventually vetted by our organization. So, I know many people are incredibly excited to introduce these new procedures, but we have to remember first, do no harm. This needs to be uh, evaluated in the labs first and we need data before we uh, adopt these procedures for our patients because we have really good operations already um, and we can't let the, our enthusiasm for new procedures supplant what is decades of data. I agree with you, man, 100%. Uh, what I will add is this, we always have a desire uh, especially academic surgeons, to innovate, uh, to be faster, to be better, to do more. But when you get to a point, like, for example, how much, how much more could we improve a laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure, right? What else can you do? I mean, so uh, I, I saw one of the NOSCAR videos that three years ago, Chinese surgeon goes through the rectum of an endoscope, makes a uh, cholecystotomy, removes the stones and close with clips. I mean, it makes no sense, right? So we, we got to a point that sleep gastrectomy is very solid and it's here to stay. You know, the question would be, how are we going to make like a massive improvement? No, it's going to be like just incremental ones. And I think through flexible endoscopy, that's going to be the answer. Perhaps, you know, a combination of sleep gastrectomy and they do a dental resurfacing. That's, those are the questions we should be asking, not like how many more centimeters or how we're going to be routing, rerouting the bowel. So. Yeah, and I think just to comment um, as a fellowship director, when I think about this question, 
innovation is fantastic, but I do think um, from a fellow standpoint, when you look at this, you know, you really have to start with the basics, master the things that you're going to be using forever, and then work on the innovation and the newer things. Um, I think sometimes we get swept up in wanting to do all the cool new stuff um, that we forget that we really have to master the, the fundamental skills before, before moving to that level. I agree. Excellent points. Excellent points. Thank you, guys. I just want to, um, I'm going to sneak in one more question here, a comment on the question. So um, personally, I think a lot of the data has shown that sleeve gastrectomy is a lot better than we ever thought it was going to be, especially 10 years ago, and our, our techniques are getting a lot more standardized and, and better. And my practice has changed to some degree uh, by doing more sleeve gastrectomies, because I think in the, the patient where we try to throw everything at them, i.e. the gastric bypass, 10 years ago, we're seeing a lot of um, weight regain and, and the distillation procedures really haven't gotten any traction or, or evidence that they work very well. So the sleeve plus procedures, I think, are, gonna, are going to, to, to impact the, the future of our specialty. With that being said, Matt, when I look at the sleeve gastrectomy with JJ bypass, I know there's been a few uh, studies out of China that have looked at, at midterm, the three and five year data of these operations. That, that blind loop worries me a bit about, you know, about what we've learned from the JI bypass of the 1970s that's really given bariatric surgery um, a bad name at the time, and we're, we're still trying to recover from that to some degree in the in the arena of, of public perception. Matt, can you comment on that blind limb and, and if bacterial overgrowth is a problem or an issue? On most of these sleeve plus procedures, uh, it isn't really a blind limb because it is, um, there still is flow through that um, uh, area. So you're right, we don't want a long limb that has no flow through it. In the historic procedures, that blind limb didn't have bile efflux either. So if there is a blind limb now, it's shorter and there's usually bile through it, or in these sleeve plus procedures, it's a partial diversion. So uh, there is flow through the duodenum for some of them. Thank you. And with that, I want to thank you guys for your expertise, the time you're taking, teaching our fellows, being leaders in our field. I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I'm sure the sentiment is the same from the rest of the team. And we look forward to seeing you guys not only for the West Coast Q&A session this afternoon, but in future renditions of this lecture series. Thank you guys very much and uh, uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crow, Dr. Morales. Um, I think as um, placed in the comments, such eye-opening talks, a lot of topics to cover. Um, Dr. Um, Lloyd and I uh, are so thrilled to to be able to 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 pick your brains um, in regards to your time today. So, um, in summary, um, there is only one um, uh, place by the fellows. And I do encourage all the fellows that this is such a unique opportunity. So please go to Q&A right now and ask a question. But um, there's one question it looks like from Dr. Ilo, uh, Ilyakova. How can fellows get involved in artificial intelligence, bioinformatics projects outside? I know that you mentioned that there is a program at um, MGH, but outside of that, how, how would you suggest that they could get involved? Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for the question. I would say the first thing is like, you need to be knowledgeable about it, right? Not just saying, I'm gonna do AI research. Like we hear all the time when people say, I wanna do outcomes research, but what are gonna be all the, the bases, the fundamentals that you're gonna to need to do that? So you need to be, first of all, instruct yourself uh, on understand what are, what's the prob probabilistics, what is like uh, inference, what are the, the methodology can be used, right? But this is just the beginning. The, the most important thing would be access to data sets. And the access to data sets can be video data sets or it could be other like outcomes data sets. And then you have to apply the methodology or the, the thought process that you have uh, to see if you can achieve, uh, you know, elucidative hypothesis. The, the biggest hurdle would be more than the data sets would be the partnership with a computer uh, scientist. And, and that's a lot of the times the hardest portion. I'm going to tell here, for example, uh, uh, in Boston, 
when we started, we had to go across the river, which was lucky enough to be MIT, and just knock on their door and beg, and then could you work with us in the free time? And, uh, but now because uh, computer vision in medicine, because radiology pathology became very well established, and surgical AI is becoming like probably the next hot spot, uh, I can, I can guarantee you if you come up with a project with your own data set, with a, a, a nice hypothesis to the engineers that you have in your university or nearby, uh, you can come up and start doing some projects. If not, contact us, contact you know, folks at Cleveland Clinic and other places as well, that they are probably going to have some engineers going to be loving to discuss those uh, you know, potential projects as well. And also uh, through SAGES and SMBS as well. Uh, soon we're going to be having much more collaborations in terms of the societies for fostering those. I actually have a follow-up question um, for that. So, you know, it's really exciting to be a part of the field now when we have so much innovation and so much is happening, um, you know, and it's really great that we're doing AI, but in general, like, how would you recommend that fellows and even um, new attendings get more involved in some of the investigative trials. So I know Dr. Crow, for instance, had mentioned um, some new techniques that are on the horizon and um, you know, new uh, innovations from industry. Like how do you tap into that as well? Yeah, so I think um, the, the, probably the easiest way is joining to bigger projects that are already occurring. And by uh, you know, gathering the data, sharing the data, and also learning how to annotate the data. Because a lot of the times I tell, for me, if you go back seven years ago, when I was just learning all of this, was also all super foreign, it made no sense whatsoever. It was only, it took a lot of so many meetings and hearing from the engineers and other physicians who already knew to know how to get to the next level. And then you're gonna, you're gonna be surprised, but you're gonna come very quick when you're gonna have your, your particular critical question about what should we solve next? And I've seen this, like I'm also the, the, the chair of the AI task force, and on the beginning, it was pretty much like a monologue, but now everybody from the task force comes with their own projects and discuss like, what can we do next? Could be from a structural need project, could be from like a governance uh, point of view, and also could be from a much more scientific, like a uh, hypothesis driven uh, research. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing kind of that evolution, right? You're the single person and then suddenly you're amongst friends and then suddenly a crowd, so that's great. Um, Dr. Crow, there's a question for you in regards to the reason, or I'm sorry, Dr. Copper in the um, group is asking, what is the reason for suggesting the SADI or SADI to be performed more as a revisional conversion procedure versus a primary procedure? So it sounds like, um, I think that in the US there is some differences, but it, it's a little bit more of a revision versus primary. And so what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I think it's effective for both. I don't want to imply that it should only be used as a conversional procedure. I think it's an excellent conversional procedure for patients who have had a sleeve gastrectomy, weight regain, and don't have GERD. Uh, for those patients that have GERD, I think a wound wide gastric bypass is probably a better option. Um, but for patients with higher BMI and significant weight gain after sleep, I think it's a great conversion procedure. But I also think it's an excellent primary procedure uh, for selected patients. It has uh, proven durability and efficacy, both in terms of weight loss and resolution of weight-related comorbid conditions. The only caveat to that is that you have to have a conversation up front with patients just to make sure that they understand the metabolic implications of this more powerful operation. Uh, and I think for those patients in particular, follow-up would be critical. So you have to have an engaged patient that you offer a primary more metabolic operation to. Um, and that's true for SADI or, or standard due venal switch. I have a question in regards to, yeah, you touched upon surgeries across the world, um, endoscopic, um, all these other modalities. If you had um, one or two sentences for the fellows, what would you say is the best thing, right? Do we now need to have that second fellowship in, you know, surgical endoscopy? I know that some, um, you know, not all fellowships are the same or whatnot. And how do you even like navigate, like, what would be the best for that patient? I know that's like a loaded question, but man, <laughs> even for my, my own practice, you think to yourself like, oh, that duodenal mucosal uh, ablation, I want to I try that, right? Because you sort of get to a place where you're 
thinking about revisions, you're thinking about the complication rates, what was the first operation you should be doing in the first place. Anyways, loaded question, but what's your one or two <laughs> suggestions to have a navigate? Well, I, I, I love your response. And I, I think that that is a reflection of our field. Uh, it's rapidly moving. There are tremendous advances that have occurred the past 10 years and will continue to occur in the next three to five and 10 years and beyond. So one, it's a tremendous time to be in this field. Obviously we have a spectrum of effective therapies to apply to our patients. And it's up to us as, as clinicians to figure out whether that's a, a powerful surgery, um, a platform surgery for something in the future, an endoluminal procedure, or medical therapies, or most likely some combination of all of those things. Um, I think, especially at, a, at the early start of your career, when you see all these wonderful things happening, you get very excited by them, and you should, um, but I would uh, caution everyone uh, to, to really follow the data, uh, look at what's um, being approved from a society standpoint, um, from an FDA standpoint, and trends around the world. Uh, I, I think that increasingly we understand that in the United States, obviously there's huge diversity in terms of our patients um, from a comorbidity profile, or from a genetic profile, from an access and socioeconomic status standpoint. Uh, and then that's amplified around the world. So not all of these procedures will be available, nor should they be applied to patients here. Um, but, but keep attuned to this, it'll be rapidly progressing. And I do think uh, for the fellows listening to this, that endoscopy and endoluminal surgery will be a part of every GI surgeon's practice in the at least near future, uh, if not longer term or even now. And, and we have great resources as a society. Uh, a lot of our program is built around endoluminal procedures, both as diagnostic and therapeutic, uh, is rescue procedures for complications, but also as primary endoluminal procedures. Take advantage of these. The Be Safe curriculum is an outstanding curriculum that I mentioned is um, uh, supported both by SAGES and ASMBS and uh, is a chance to build upon a, a basic endoscopy skill set. Uh, but I think that endoscopy is critical to the metabolic surgeon now and in the future. We have another question in the chat um, from Dr. Son, and it's actually really interesting. I was thinking about this as well. Um, you know, so now most of the endoluminal procedures are not covered by insurance. And so she's asking, you know, does insurance coding or even patient education level play a role when you're deciding which surgery or procedure to offer to the patients? Like, how do you uh, decide? Absolutely. Um, you know, many patients will come in having heard about a press release of, of some perceived to be less invasive procedure and ask for it by name. And you may have a long conversation talking about the outcomes, uh, the, the, the procedural complications and expectations. And then after 10 or 15 minutes of having a conversation say, oh yeah, and by the way, this isn't covered by insurance. And then that would have been a non-starter. So I think you have to bring that up front uh, and, and let patients know that. It's fluid, that, that will change in time, but a lot of these endoluminal therapies are not covered by standard insurance. And the, the, the self-pay in many organizations approximates surgical intervention. So you've got to, got to weigh that too. Um, I believe there's no further questions. I know it is um, at the one o'clock hour on the West Coast. And I know that for you guys on the um, other coast that, you know, having you log in early this morning as well as now we do want to thank you for your expertise your perspective this is like such a fantastic topic that I think could go on and on and I agree that there's so many resources with our society for um, ASMBS and the program so um, that is wonderful Dr. Lloyd um, did you want to ask any other questions before we potentially give some time back or um, or things um Nothing off the top of my head, just to really thank our panelists both for excellent talks. Those were both like really thought provoking and just really comprehensive in the coverage of what you guys went over. Um, you know, I think the fellows seem also really interested based on some of the comments in here. Um, but thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Can I just add one quick thing here? I, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Crow. Flex endo is the future of GI surgery. And then you guys got to get involved on this. You guys are not only if you don't like it, but if you like it and if your fellowship somehow doesn't offer it, 
find a way for your next job or just hook up with a GI person. Listen, it's like uh, when Ponsky started this like a long time ago, became a re re reality right now for many things in bariatrics, that's the future. Yeah, well, and I, I agree. Um, lots of great options, but follow the evidence. I absolutely agree with that. I think that's some of the challenges I think that we have in bariatrics, there's so much to choose from and yet, you know, there's not a lot of long-term too. And I think that that is important to, to educate ourselves, our patients, understand, you know, we do have options, but to always hopefully get the evidence there. So huge appreciation. What a fantastic talk. What a wonderful opportunity to listen to um, all of these innovative um, things. So thank you and enjoy the weekend and be safe. Happy holidays. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.